And welcome to The Pitch here on Stock Charts TV. My name is Erin Swindlin with DecisionPoint.com. And I would like to welcome you and tell you happy International Women's Day. I am absolutely thrilled that you are here to share this special day during Women's History Month. In particular, we have an all-female panel. Very exciting. Today we have with us Danielle Shea, Mish Snyder, and Mary Ellen McGonigal, and they are all going to pitch five stocks each for you to consider and look at. We'll discuss some of the interesting things that are going on currently in the market and get started uh, pretty much right away. So we'll do those stock picks, then we're going to go and do some Q&A. And I'm so excited to have you all here. Thanks. Good to be here. Great day for yeah. to celebrate women in the investing community. Indeed, I, indeed. I, I've been doing this for a very long time. And when I got started, there were very few women. So it really does my heart good to not only celebrate International Women's Day, but to be with such esteemed company today of all women. So yay. Fantastic. Yay is right. <laughs> and Danielle, you're a little bit more new to the crowd here as far as um, technical analysis. I'm really happy to see a young woman, of course, getting involved in technical analysis as well of the stock markets. Oh, God, yes. we're all young women. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, have, we have a little more experience, let's put it that way. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. The market is just having a, a crazy good day today. It's been really rough here in the bear market, but looking a lot better, that's for sure. All right, let us start with, uh, well, Danielle, I have your chart up first, so let's go ahead and start with you. Of course. So first off, I just wanted to look at the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ did um, enter bear market territory. However, what has occurred here is down on the lows. So many investors have gotten short. Um, sentiment has been really negative. And, you know, the majority of um, the core areas within tech, whether you're looking at the semiconductors or the cloud or just XLK in general, have just been so weak. And so what ended up happening was, well, first of all, you know, if you don't want to be involved in a lot of that volatility, um, staying away from tech right now makes sense, which is why later in the presentation, I was going to talk about consumer staples. But what's happening today in particular is just the fact that everyone was short at the lows. And now we're seeing a bit of a short squeeze come through. It doesn't change the fact that we did enter a bear market and we do need to look for more downside. But I think just at least for today, maybe tomorrow, we can get some decent follow through as short sellers cover. I think that is a, a great uh, analysis of what's going on. I've been talking about a bear market for a while. People have been a little upset with me because we hadn't had that official 20% down. But uh, sure enough, that's what we're looking at. Uh, let's go ahead and look at your first chart, Mish. Okay, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to look at Beyond first, even though it's really been in a downtrend for a long time. I wanted to pull this up because we're in a situation, in case those of you have been living under a rock, where food prices have gone up a lot and grain prices in particular, but it has also affected all kinds of things like fertilizer, feed for cattle, et cetera. And Beyond Meat is a plant-based product that was actually IPO'd a few years ago to Sensation. And after that, really, it hasn't done very much. And actually, it IPO'd at around 40. So as we're talking today, it actually hit that IPO level and now is bouncing with the rest of the market. However, as far as a trend goes, even though it is still very much in diapers, the whole idea of plant-based eating, I believe, is something that will continue to catch on uh, as we go through generationally, the younger generation more turning towards environmental-friendly 
situation and everything from electric cars to uh, solar energy to plant-based diets. So anyway, if you look at the chart right now, as you can see, we've been in this strong downturn. If you look at the other two indicators below, those are our ACP plugins at stock charts. One is actually the leadership, which means how it's performing against the benchmark. And the other is its momentum. So in terms of the price right here, if we're going to start bottoming out, and that's what I'm looking for is 40 kind of a base in terms of where it's bottoming and currently it's trading with the bounce at around 43 and a half, then you want to see a couple of things. And particularly, you want to see that very bottom indicator, which is the momentum indicator, start to pick up in momentum, ideally cross that blue line, which is the 50-day moving average. You want to see the middle chart, which is the leadership. You want to see it starting to gain a little bit of leadership over SPY, which is the benchmark we use. And you want to see the price get back over probably somewhere around $50, $50 a share. And then we can say that perhaps finally Beyond Meat has found some kind of footing. Um, but you really, at this point now, I'd say more is a patience type of trade. I just wanted to show it because I do believe at some point this year, unless the market continues to go way lower, that this will be one to keep an eye on. Excellent. All right, Mary Ellen, you are up. My first stock here is a small cap energy name, BSM mm -hmm. and it's Blackstone Minerals. I'm pointing out here the fact that the stock is breaking out of a five month base. So oil stocks have been just obviously on the run this year. It's only recently that smaller companies in this space are beginning to come into their own. And we can see that this uh, outside momentum indicators are bullish. RSI is positive, as is the MACD. So this is a $2.6 billion company, and it's trading at about 17 times earnings, a nice relative to the broader markets, a nice relatively low PE. But what is really attractive about this particular company is its 8.6% percent yield. It is a limited partnership. One needs to know that for tax purposes, but certainly a very nice high yield. The earnings estimates for this year, they're calling for 50 percent earnings for this year over last year, which was already a strong year. And we did see Brent crude hit one hundred and forty dollars today. Now, of course, it is pulling back from that level on news, but any kind of oil pricing above $50 is very beneficial to these energy companies. Obviously, we are and have been well above that. So I think this, as well as other energy names, could continue to do quite well. Nice volume characteristics on that breakout as well, which is something that you want to see to indicate a continuation rally. Excellent. Yeah, I like that breakout. Looking pretty good there. All right, let's go ahead and go back to Ms. Danielle. So due to the volatility in the NASDAQ, I mean, normally you're going to find me trading um, a lot of tickers that actually do have a lot of volatility, but I wanted to stick with consumer staples right now, especially from a long-term investing perspective, just because of the volatility in the NASDAQ. Um, consumer staples has been holding up really well. This is a daily chart. Um, on this chart, you can see that it's been in consolidation really since the beginning of January. Because it's in consolidation and in a bullish trend, um, I am looking for it to break out to the upside. If we can get through about 75, 76, where we have resistance, we should be able to make it up into about $80. There definitely is going to be, um, there definitely are going to be some headwinds in this area just due to inflation. But a lot of the picks that I have focused on for this presentation today are companies that have been doing really well on earnings despite the high inflationary environment that we're in. So I'm just basically looking at the fact that, you know, yes, we know um, that gas prices are going through the roof. Yes, we know that inflation's getting stronger. Um, but we also know that in times of market volatility, focusing on a little bit more slow and steady stocks can be something that investors can do if they're not interested in being involved in the type of volatility that, you know, cybersecurity brings. Right, right. I can see that for sure. <laughs> Um, definitely with this volatility. And I know a lot of safety uh, were, were often 
moving in that direction of those staples right now. So let's go ahead, Mish. Let's look at your charts here. Well, this is sort of similar to actually what Mary Ellen showed in that it's a, a mineral. This is rare earth mineral. This company was a SPAC, actually one of the more successful ones. And this is Mountain Pass. Now, Mountain Pass is a company in California. And what they do is the largest Western hemisphere miner of rare earth minerals. And it's been an, I've been trading this company in and out since the SPAC. Actually, we were long the SPAC because you cannot have electric vehicles and solar energy without rare earth minerals. And China is still the largest miner of rare earth minerals. And so in the, uh, during the, the um, Trump administration, when we tried to lose our dependence on China rare earth mining and go more to the United States, that's when this company really came to light. Currently, though, we actually, even though mine the minerals here, they still get sent to China, I found out, and there's been some scandal around the company. But nonetheless, you can see, I consider it a commodity, obviously. And what we've had after a test of the 200-day moving average just about a month ago, it had very good earnings. It tested the 200-day moving average just a couple of days ago. We got back into the stock actually yesterday and was extremely happy to see this type of momentum today. We actually <laughs> took a little, yeah, right? We t- that love when that happens. We took up, uh, especially on Women's Day. Yes. Um, we, yeah, right? We took a, a profit target already, one profit target. But if you look down at the other indicators that we just talked about when we talked about Beyond, you see a different story. Number one is you see it has good leadership over the SPY. And then if you go down the momentum, although it hasn't quite caught up in the momentum because it's still under both the 50 and the 200 day moving averages, it looks like if it stays up here at price, you'll start to see the momentum accelerate as well. This is a stock that I actually predicted for 2022 could double in price. Uh, That didn't look like such a good call a few days ago, but it's looking better now. So this is one not too late if we confirm Two days over that 50-day moving average, we call that a phase change. It will be a phase change to bullish, in which case this could be something to look at. And uh, probably, I would say, at this point, should hold about $40 a share. I'd say this thing, if it takes out 50, can easily go up to $75 a share. And now it's poised to break out of a cup with handle base at that 47 level as well. So you have a couple of really good technical uh, positive signals going on. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Yes, <laughs> looks great. I'll race you to the trading desk. Oh, you're already in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go with your second one, Mary Ellen, and that is Eli Lilly. I, yes. I've seen some pharmaceuticals starting to pick up. We are seeing healthcare stocks, and it's always good to see that. Healthcare stocks coming into the forefront. They were one of the top performers last week and going into this week as well. And Eli Lilly in particular, you can see it pulled right back to that 200-day simple moving average and more recently has been trending upward above each of those key moving averages, shorter-term moving averages crossing above the longer term. That's a nice golden cross secondary uh, condition there. But what I did want to share with you is the fact that these pharmaceutical stocks, particularly Eli Lilly and some of these larger firms, are not experiencing inflation-driven higher cost. So they do have that benefit going into this uh, period that we're in currently, but also the companies are finding that they can in fact raise the prices of their drugs without much pushback. Eli Lilly in particular has a, uh, it's called Humalong. It's a diabetes product that these, uh, unfortunately these patients really cannot do without. They will have to withstand higher pricing. So another factor here with Eli Lilly is that they have raised their dividend, which is very good in this inflationary period. We just posted a 7.5% increase in inflation. Eli Lilly's dividend is up 15.3% over the past 12 months. So in other words, their dividend growth is higher than the growth that we're seeing in inflation. They also have COVID drugs uh, that are being uh, approved in the UK. So lots of good things going on here for Eli Lilly. Excellent. 
Ma- oh, Mary, right. Let's just go, before I just Mary Ellen just hit on something that I've been talking about so much when I go on the media. Sure. Which mm-hmm. is in, in the world of non. And I so I just want to jump on the point because I'm really glad she showed that chart. In the world of non-cyclicals right now, you do want to look at not only some of these pharmaceuticals, but also even just the medical devices area in general, particularly as people will start to do more routine procedures that they did not do during the COVID. So I thought that was a great sector to point out, one that I've been watching very carefully as well, not only XBI, but also even IHI, which is medical devices. So I love IHI. I can't wait for it to come back on. Exactly. I've been waiting, chomping at the bit. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead to Danielle to Walmart here. So I like Walmart here. This is a weekly chart of Walmart. I know Walmart really hasn't gone anywhere for quite some time, but because of that, I'm continuing to build up a position. As you can see, I mean, this has been consolidating for what, the past over a year now. Um, And not only is it consolidating, but it's consolidating in a bullish trend above the key moving averages. The pink one is going to be the 200 simple. You have the blue one on there. That's the 100 simple. And then it's basically teetering on top of the 50 simple and the eight and the 21 EMA. So, I mean, overall it has a bullish chart structure. You do have a dividend there. You also have the fact that, you know, Walmart is a leader in the consumer staple space. They also are becoming a leader in e-commerce. They're also competing with Amazon via their own subscription service at this point. So, I mean, while you can look at it and say, hey, you know, Walmart hasn't really moved very much lately. Is this something that I want to get involved in? I mean, for me, I do think that it's one of the stronger names Within this area, I think it's a leader. And I think that because it has consolidated for so long, it's building up energy and it's going to break out. And so I want to be involved in that before it breaks out because I think that it can make a price target of at least 155, if not 160. So sitting at 140, I mean, it's a pretty decent upside for, you know, a strong and steady name in consumer staples. Yes, exactly. By the way, Danielle, Walmart is also getting into the health space. So that would be a boon for that stock as well. So not only as a consumer staple discount store during hard times, but also entering a space, again, that could have some protection against inflation, as Mary Ellen pointed out. So I just wanted to add that. Um, oh, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. So uh, silver. Well, I started out in life as a commodities trader. I was on the commodities exchange in New York for 13 years. And... Um, and I traded COMEX, I traded the softs, I traded NYMEX, the oil market. So I kind of like to say I've waited 40 years for the commodities <laughs> market to get going again. That's and funny. even though when the commodities market gets going, it's not necessarily good news for the consumer. And you always have to kind of reconcile with that. So I always say if you make a lot of money off the backs of rising prices in commodities, do something good for the world. That's kind of what I try to think about. But anyway, getting back to silver. So silver, and just in terms of inflation and the value, this has been so undervalued. It's actually kind of crazy. Back in 1980, silver was traded up to about $40, $45 an ounce. And then the Hunt brothers came in, tried to corner the market. It's got killed and has never really gotten anywhere near those prices. But if you think about 1980, the Dow was trading under 1,000. And now the Dow is well over 30,000. So if you just look at that in terms of ratio, silver is almost half of what it was in 1980 while the Dow is 33 times greater. So what does that tell you? That this could be one of the most undervalued commodity plays and also has industrial uses. So now we've just seen this big breakout over this base that goes back for quite some time. We're nowhere near even the highs, though, that we were trading back in 2020 when we had that last big move up after COVID and the um, whole stimulus checks created that big market. And of course, we're seeing this kind of weird inverted doji hammer candle right now, but that may not sustain by the end of the day. Today, it broke out over, that's a Bollinger Band, so that's good resistance. Obviously, when we talk about momentum and leadership, you can see momentum reached a new high today. 
and the leadership, of course, keeps going, which tells me that silver, I don't even think has really gotten started yet. And you may have these vicious rallies at a bear market rally, but, but, but inflation, regardless of whether the Russia-Ukraine situation abates, is here and has been here and was on its way. So I like silver right now, if we look at it in terms of our price per ounce, as long as it holds over $24 an ounce, I think we can see 35, maybe even 40, maybe even higher. So right now looking at the SLV, uh, you're looking at right now, it looks like you have some support there at around that $24. And if it holds at $24, I think you can have a pretty tight risk. You would know pretty much right away if it's going to start having one of these vicious downturns, which, by the way, commodities and volatility are almost redundant. That's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so there you go. Silver, so, we've been long for a while, and, uh, and, and, and I'm really, really thinking that, that, like I said, that this hasn't even caught on yet. Excellent. Well, we know gold has taken off, so this might be the forgotten metal. Exactly. And and actually, there's a thing with Commodities Trader that in inflation time, silver really is supposed to outperform gold. And that hasn't happened because of the geopolitical situation. So if right. that starts to flip and silver outperforms gold, it could be that we're seeing the geopolitics part calm down, but the inflation, not so much. All um, right. Excellent points. All right, Marilyn, you're up. Yes, agriculture. I'm, we were just mentioning that. Right. I'm going to take the commodity theme from Mission, extend it a little bit here. This is DBA. It's an agricultural fund, and I've listed up there their top holdings by uh, percent. We can see coffee, corn, sugar, and soybean up there. And it has been in a confirmed uptrend here of late. You have your outside momentum indicators that are trending upward and very high in the way of volume characteristics. And a lot of this has to do, of course, with the uh, strife and the conflict with uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine in particular is a big producer of a number of these commodity products, and there is demand that is very much in place. And any time that supply gets constrained, you will see these agricultural commodities spike here. Uh, for instance, coffee is up almost 4% today. Corn has been certainly trending higher for quite some time now. Uh, sugar's up about one and a half percent today and so on. So each of these areas within the commodity space, uh, here is in particular corn, you can see the uptrend that it's been in. So just based on those weightings, this uh, DBA was uh, very interesting to me. Uh, wheat is actually uh, pulling back pretty sharply today, but has been in a very confirmed uptrend. So excellent. Danielle, you are up next with chart number four. Let's see, right there, Mondelez. All right, so I'm selecting Mondelez as well because Mondelez, again, is in the consumer staple space. Um, they have shown via you know surveys and whatnot that people are snacking more um, just due to the changes over the last couple of years because so many people are working from home. Um, and this is one company that has benefited from that. You can see that the chart pattern is pretty strong overall. It's definitely, you know, there's been a few places where we've seen some pullbacks. Right here, I think it's very interesting because it's sitting right on the 200 simple on the daily chart. This is really for me a make or break zone. If a ticker can sit there and if it can hold that zone and trade up above, for me, it's a perfect entry. Now, conversely, if it breaks through that zone on high volume and can't hold it, then I would definitely not get into it. But what I'm watching for in this ticker right now is the fact that it's pulled back nicely. It's trying to hold on to that area of support. It's oversold. Um, and I think I could potentially trade it back up to at least 68, if not 70. Nice. All right, Mish, we're going to hit yours next. Let's go to Tan. And I have to say, I, I brought Tan to the table um, last week on the Decision Point show and just in time for the big pullback. 
tell me what you're seeing here on the ETF. When I put when I did this chart yesterday, it was at 68 and then went up to like 77 today. So that's a big move for this. And um, again, jumping on the commodity theme and energy and oil. And yes, Mary Ellen, I am all about DBA. Um, this is based on really more market psychology than actual fundamentals at this point, because clearly with the narrative about well, oil and, and gas is so expensive, we really have to look at alternative energy, which, of course, right now has its own issues. This was overdue for a rally because it had been selling off while oil had been going up. So, again, I love to look at these ratios when they get really spread between two instruments related. And so that certainly happened with solar and with oil. And there was a survey that if oil or gas got to $5 a gallon, 80% of people said they would turn to EVs. Well, whether that's true or not, we go back to the market psychology. So here we are over the 50-day moving average. So we're in a recuperation phase. It's not quite bullish the way oil is. And we are going to run into some resistance soon. So I don't know if I would necessarily be getting into this right now. Um, and which why I was so excited about it about $10 ago. Um, but nonetheless, <laughs> keep your eye on a couple of things. Number one is, again, you can see that the momentum here, if you go down to the bottom, is just hitting into resistance. If we can get through that 200, that green line, and then the zero line, then perhaps that means we're also going to get through the 200 day. I would almost wait for that to get in at this point. Otherwise, what could happen is we could wind up with some mean reversion trade, which means that TAN breaks down back under 75 and, and also breaks back down under, uh, can't quite get through that Bollinger Band that meets the green moving average on the real motion indicator and is in for another sell-off. So that's something to be aware of. But a good dip would possibly be interesting, or like I said, at this point, more proven strength. There you go. Yeah, it's kind of volatile. And I know, um, you know, generally, I, I try not to trade in that volatile space during a bear market. But you know, it just was really looking good. So I couldn't resist. All right, Mary Ellen, Kraft Heinz in yes. consumer staples. I'm going to take Danielle's theme and uh, expand upon that. This is a consumer staple stock. and Many of you may be familiar. Heinz, of course, famous for their ketchup. They have a lot of other products as well. Meats and cheeses. Danielle talked about people staying at home, eating at home. So they've been able to benefit from that as well. The company is Warren Buffett's fifth largest position. He's held it for quite some time. It does offer a 4.4% yield. And you're going to want that yield in a period of high inflation as well as upcoming high interest rates. The stock formation wise is poised to break out of a cup with handle base. So very classic uh, base formation. You can see the RSI MACD trending upward and in a positive position. The company did report earnings mid-February, 25% uh, above estimates. So all in all, a good looking name there in the staple space. Excellent. And now we're on our final charts here. Danielle, your final chart, Costco. So I love Costco. I'm sure you ladies probably <laughs> shop at Costco too, don't you? <laughs> yes. Oh, totally. <laughs> I'm a big fan and I also have a theory that if I can make enough money on my Costco stock that all my purchases are free. So <laughs> I have I like it. But in all seriousness, I mean, this company has been doing great. You can see it has an incredibly strong trend. Um, when you look at the overall chart pattern, I mean, it definitely has relative strength. I mean, you have so many sectors right now in the market that are in bear market territory and this ticker is just clinging to you know, just barely below all time highs. So, I mean, you have that going for it. You also have the fact that this ticker ran up into earnings. Now, normally in the market, I'm always looking for bullish stocks to trade higher in about a three week time frame going into earnings. And last quarter, it did not happen at all. Sentiment was so weak that ticker sold off going into earnings and anticipation and ba of bad news. But when you look at Costco, it was the exact opposite. It traded higher going into earnings after the report came out. It held up well. It's holding up above the 50 simple. It has that consolidation that I think is going to break out to make a new high. 
So I'm looking for at least a retest of 570. If we can retest 570 and break to a new high, after that, I'd be targeting 600. But I mean, the technicals are in line. The fundamentals are in line. They've been doing well with earnings. They've increased their dividend. Um, people are loyal to Costco, just like me. So I'm buying four <laughs> shares here. <laughs> and I was going to add to that, uh, Costco in the past has been able to secure nice revenues on their sale of gasoline. And with gas hitting $6 a gallon, that could be a boost as well. That's actually Excellent. a really good point. Because I mean, I know it is difficult for Costco uh, because they have strict profit margins on their goods. It, it is difficult for them to you know, increase their profit margin in that way. But I didn't even think about the gasoline aspect. That's, mm -hmm. that's really smart. I mean, I know yeah. that they have done a really good job um, creating all of their own product lines and they have a lot of consumer loyalty, but, and I, you know what, I bet the healthcare aspect is there as well. I'm sure, yes, yes. Yes, an excellent point. Did you know that they are ri uh, raising their uh, prices though for their memberships? I'm sure they are. I mean, yeah. the fact of the matter is, is that so many of these companies, I mean, we're, we've been seeing it over the course of the past couple months is that the companies are passing prices on to consumers. Sure. And so far, consumer spending has still been strong. And I mean, it, it is going to be impacted at some point, probably very soon. But I mean, companies like this, that's something that, you know, if your dollar is being stretched more, are you more likely to go to Costco or are you more likely to go somewhere more expensive? So, well, and you did point out the the loyalty of the customers and I'm right there with you. I, I'll pay it. <laughs> All well, right, and... Mish. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that that's one way that they trap you in because when you're paying that price for your membership, you feel like you have to go there because you want to make up for the membership price, right? So <laughs> good point. <laughs> All right, Miss, your final one is floor. Well, once again, I just want to say that those of you who are going to be listening to this, that what I love about women traders. Uh, is that they're using, we're all using our consumer instincts. So what have we all brought you today, besides the trending commodities, obviously, that are going up, that we all feel the pinch on in our pockets, is the consumer staples. So I just want to say brava to my, my brethren here. Because um, <laughs> I've been thinking the same exact way. So, you know, I won't necessarily say it's totally a gender thing, but it's definitely partly a gender thing. So that's what makes us unique as traders. But anyway, um, so let's go, <laughs> let's go on to, um, again, this is again in an energy theme, but it was kind of a well-kept secret. This is Flower or Floor, I'm not quite sure floor. how you pronounce mm -hmm. it, Corporation mm -hmm. Floor. Okay. And it, it actually has to do with infrastructure and construction and materials. But it also, one of the things that it's involved with is oil and gas. So while the rest of the oil and energy markets have been going ballistic, this wasn't really doing very much. And then I noticed it reported earnings a couple of weeks ago, so I started trailing it. And I'm very much of a phase trader, so I like to use the moving averages to really time my way in. And a couple of days ago, when we saw our third day over that 50-day moving average, which is the blue line, is when we actually entered. So we've reached a couple of profit targets on this yet. And you can look, I mean, as of, as of now, but if you look at the, again, the indicators below, Momentum is improving and leadership is improving. And even though it's made a big move at this point now, if it really can hold somewhere around that $25, $26 level, there's no reason why this thing can't go much higher. Because if you look at the longer term charts, it's just breaking out this week over the 200 week moving average, which comes into 2473. And that shows a projection of up to about $35 before it runs into any other kind of resistance. So this is a, a small stock, sort of off the radar, but performing very well. Excellent. All right, Mary Ellen, you've got the, the closing word here. You've got it. And I had FLR on my list, but I did defer to you. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice space breakout happening there. Yeah, my last name is oil. And rather than the uh, exploration and production, this is an oil and gas 
field services stock. And this is a group that has only recently really been ignited. We're looking at Oceaneering, OII is the ticker symbol, and it is breaking out of a five month base on very heavy volume. The company is not that big, it's a $1.6 billion, but it's on track for earnings this year of 141% year over year growth. Next year, 73% growth, so a lot of upside on there. And the company also did get a uh, price target upgrade of late, which has helped it. The company is in deep water, offshore oil and gas. So these field services companies, again, are just now starting to come into their own and the stock looks poised for more upside. Excellent. All right. So let's sum this up. Danielle, you brought the NASDAQ uh, QQQ. XLP, the staples sector, we had uh, Walmart and Mondelez and Costco. Mish, you brought us Beyond Meat and MP Materials. We also had SLV, the Silver Trust, and TAN, the Solar ETF, as well as Fleur and Industrial for you. And then finally, Mary Ellen, we had BSM, Blackstone Materials. We had Eli Lilly, LLY, the Agricultural Fund, which all of us were very excited about, DBA, KHC for Kraft Heinz, and Oceaneering International, OII. All right, we have time for just a little bit of Q&A, so let's go ahead and just kick that right off. You know, honestly, I think the big news, of course, is the war, inflation. Are there other things that you're looking at? And so what are the, the really primary things that you're concerned about what's going on now? And are there some not so obvious areas that we haven't talked about here? We talked a lot about staples and some of the materials, but are you seeing action in some other kind of not so obvious areas? Uh, we'll start with you, Mish. Well, we've touched upon before the non-cyclical idea, obviously of the staples and of course of the healthcare space and some of the pharmaceuticals and some of the medical devices that might get going. But right now, I think that we have to talk about something more from the negative side. I mean, we've all been so bullish here in the areas that we're looking at. But I went on a show today, and I'm not going to mention any names, but a lot of the people who work for these big funds are still talking about buying growth stocks that have good balance sheets and um, have good management. And that is just such a myopic way to be looking at tech right now, these big tech stocks. For example, Apple which released a new product today, a new iPhone SE for $399, and that was their big launch. And of course, it rallied with the market a little bit today, but it's going to continue to go down. Essentially, what we really have to look at at this point is if we are in a stagflation environment, which clearly we are, that you should try to avoid that conversation that people have all the time on the media, which is, oh yeah, just buy your Apples and your NVIDIAs and your Amazons and your Microsofts because they're all gonna be great. And that may not happen. Oh, sorry, my dog just came in. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we got to hear mine bark, so. <laughs> that is the so cute. cute, oh my gosh. What kind of dog is that? It's a Havanese. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word, that was Oh my sweet. God, he just like totally ruined my train of thought. Oh yeah. So anyway, I just want, I just want to express some caution on passive investing, the buy the dip and the old, if it's got a good balance sheet and it's a great company, it's got to be good because it may not be good for two to five years or even longer. Yeah. And I know I worked with uh, institutional money managers for many years. And for the most part, they are mandated to stay in the markets. They can only go up max 5% cash. So I would think having held those positions probably over the last two, three years, they're going to be beating the drum to try and get drum up some interest to uh, keep those positions from dropping further. Absolutely, Marianne. So I know you talked a little bit about the, the NASDAQ, Danielle. Are, I mean, are you seeing anything in that area of, of interest? I know that it's in a bear market. We're having a lot of uh, issues there. I mean, honestly, it just completely depends on your time frame. I mean, I do a lot of shorter term trading where I'll be in for just overnight up to two or three weeks. And so, I mean, I don't have a problem with 
you know, coming in and trading some of the NASDAQ names on a short term time frame. But as far as long term investing, I think the biggest problem right here is that Apple is the only one in the NASDAQ that's holding up decently well. I mean, Apple's holding up above the 200 symbol um, right now. That 200 symbol is going to come in at about the $155 price point. So let's say you have what? Another $4 lower. If Apple breaks that 200 simple, I mean, so goes Apple, so goes the market even further. Normally in these kind of situations, when the market pulls back, I'm always gonna be focused on the relative strength NASDAQ names, which are gonna be AMD, Nvidia, Microsoft, Apple, Google. But if you look at Microsoft right now, I mean, Microsoft has been below the 200 simple since what, February 16th about? It tried to get above it and it couldn't. So. You know, I am heavily invested in Microsoft. I am heavily invested in NVIDIA and AMD. Those are long-term holds, and I'm not going to be closing those. I think that, you know, if and when the market starts trading higher, those are going to be the first ones that I'll add more to. I really don't have a problem with adding more shares here just as far as, a, you know, averaging in. Um I just feel like because of the weakness in the overall NASDAQ and because Apple's kind of clinging there, I just feel like the path of least resistance is still to the downside. All right, Mary Ellen, I'm going to let you have the last word today. Uh, you know, you, we used to talk about what hot, what's hot and what's not. Um, again, obvious versus not obvious right now. What, what are you looking at uh, primarily for your watch list? Yeah, there is one area we did not touch upon, and it's an area where the, they are coming in hot as it relates to earnings, and that is utility stocks. And mm. these companies have been able to, again, pass along their increased cost to the consumer. So we have uh, SO comes to mind. There are any number of these uh, utility companies that are, in fact, posting very strong numbers and are in confirmed uptrends. We can see the group here breaking out of a base and it's uh, rather compelling and particularly the uh, gas, the natural gas utility companies. Those are the hot tickets right now and some of the alternative energy within those utilities. But again, it's all about passing on uh, increase. Unfortunately, fees, we're seeing our utility bills out here triple in California and not a whole lot we can do about it. Yes, uh, certainly seeing that, you know, inflation's going to kind of hit us everywhere. And utility is an excellent point to bring up, Mary Ellen, because I know I've been uh, fishing in that pond, if you will, for uh, the last week or two um, now that we're seeing that really big run up on uh, XLU and that sector itself. All right. Well, let's go ahead. And before we all leave, I'd love for you to tell uh, everyone a little bit about what you do, where uh, people can find you. Um, Mary Ellen, I'll let you start. Sure. Yes. So I have my firm is MEM Investment Research, but it's powered by Simpler Trading. You can go to my website. I have a biweekly or twice weekly newsletter that also puts out alerts in addition to that. And I have a special offer. So if you go to my website, you can take advantage of that. Excellent. Danielle, you kind of uh, know Mary Ellen a little bit there. <laughs> yes. Um, so I've worked with Mary Ellen here at Stock Charts and also at Simpler Trading. So I'm the VP of Options at Simpler Trading. Um, I, well, you can find me in our trading room. Um, I also have my own mastery program where people can follow the trades that I'm doing in the options market. And I have a free newsletter at fivestartrader.com. Um, I also post pretty frequently on Twitter at Trader Danielle. Yes, you definitely do. I follow you. <laughs> Mish, tell us a little bit about um, Market Gauge. Well, Market Gauge is a company that was formed uh, in the late 1990s, basically for tools for institutional investors and then switched over to the retail space later on in 2000 when I joined in 2009. So my job is the director of trading education research. I have a service called Mish's Market Minute Advantage. I send alerts. Uh, we are trend traders. As I said, we've been well positioned in commodities for a long time. And me personally, uh, in the last couple of years, I've had a lot of media appearances, which has been really fun trying to go on and counteract the buy the dip crowd on no matter what happens. 
and give a little bit of reality there. And that's essentially it. I've been doing this for 40 years. I love this business so much. I can't even imagine doing anything else. And, uh, and just want to repeat, if you want to find out more about me, marketgage.com or market me to my Twitter handle. But what I want to repeat is just how excited I am to be, again, with this such a group of esteemed women traders today. Well, you're so very kind, and it has been wonderful celebrating International Women's Day with all of my favorite female technical analysts. Well, I do have a couple of others, but <laughs> it's excellent that we have a choice of analysts out there to say that we love all of these different women. You know, it's it's just such a great thing to see all of um, the you know, excitement about something that's very technical and that women have really not been a part of for a very long time. Thank you everybody for joining us today on this special month of women's history and also International Women's Day. It's been my pleasure to host the pitch. You can find it on stockchartstv.com or of course on YouTube. My name again was Erin Swenlin from DecisionPoint.com, and I would like to wish you good trading and good luck. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.